Dear colleagues, my name is Sam Vaknin and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited and a series of other books about personality disorders. Welcome to the ninth Global Experts Meeting on Advances in Neurology and Neuropsychiatry in Melbourne, July 2019. <coughs> I'm a visiting professor of psychology at Southern Federal University, Rostovon Don, Russia, and a professor of finance and a professor of psychology in CIAS CIAS, the Center for International Advanced and Professional Studies. Today I would like to um, present to you a paper on the concepts of self in a variety of disciplines. The dualistic differentiation between mens and corpus, mind and body, may be entirely artificial. It seems to be the outcome of our ignorance and the shortcomings of our language, both of which give rise to the psychophysical problem. In a series of experiments described in articles published in the magazine Science in, the mid, in mid-2007, British and Swiss researchers concluded that, <coughs> I quote, their experiments reinforce the idea that the self is closely tied to a within-body position, which is dependent on information from the senses. We look at self with regard to spatial characteristics, and maybe they form the basis upon which self-consciousness has evolved. This is what one of them told the new scientists. Um, the article is titled, Out-of-Body Experiences Are All in the Mind. It was published on the 23rd of August, uh, 2007. The fundament of our mind and of our self is the mental map we create of our body. We call it body image or body map. It is a detailed psychic rendition of our corporeal self, based, of course, on sensor, sensory input, and above all, on perception and other kinesthetic senses. This model incorporates representations of other objects and results at a higher level in a world map or a world image. <clears throat> this world map often does not immediately react to actual changes in the body itself, such as, for example, amputation, which results in the phantom limb phenomenon. This map is also exclusionary of facts that contradict the paradigm at the basis of the world map. The map is involved even in reactions that are largely considered objective and triggered by outside stimuli. Uh, for example, Patrick Haggard and his colleague Marjolaine Kammers of University Lon uh, College London have demonstrated um, the, sensation and the sensation and experience of pain are crucially dependent on the body's representation in the mind. Um, the article was published in Current Biology on September 27, 2010. The detailed and ever-changing dynamic map constitutes the set of outer constraints and threshold conditions for the brain's operations. The triple processes of interaction, endogenous and exogenous, integration, also known as assimilation, and accommodation, reconcile the brain's programs, sets of instructions, to these constraints and conditions. In other words, these are processes of solving dynamic, though always partial, equations. The set of all the solutions to all these equations constitutes the personal narrative, or what we colloquially call personality. And thus, organic and mental disorders, a dubious distinction at best, have many characteristics in common. For example, confabulation, antisocial behavior, emotional absence of flatness, indifference, psychotic episodes, and so on. The brain's functional set is hierarchical and consists of feedback loops. It aspires to a kind of um, equilibrium. It's, um, it's a form of homeostasis that is maintained via these equations. Um, at the most basic level, um, the most basic level is mechanical. Hardware, neurons, glia, etc., and operating system software. This software consists of a group of sensory motor applications. It is separated from the next level by exegetic or hermeneutic instructions 
the feedback loops, and their interpretation. And this is the cerebral equivalent of a compiler in computer science. Each level of instructions is distinguished from the next and connected to it meaningfully and operationally by one such compiler. And here again, the body is the mind. Next, follow the functional instructions, the how-to type of commands. How to see, how to place visuals in context, how to hear, how to collate and correlate sensory input, and so on. Yet, these commands should not be confused with the real thing, the final product. How, see, how to see is not the same as seeing. Seeing is a much more complex, multi-layered, interactive and versatile activity than the simple act of light penetration and its conveyance to the brain. Thus, separated by another compiler which generates, which generates meanings, a, compi a compiler which we can call easily a dictionary, we reach the realm of meta-instructions. This is a gigantic classificatory taxonomic system. It contains and applies rules of symmetry, left versus right, the laws of physics, light versus dark, colors, social codes, face recognition, behavior, mores, and synergetic or correlated activity, seeing, music, etc. Design principles would yield the application of the following principles to the organization and architecture of the brain. First of all, there would be areas of specialization dedicated to hearing, reading, smelling, etc. Then there would be redundancy, um, unutilized overcapacity, capable of taking over functions from damaged centers, as is clearly demonstrated in cases of brain injury, brain trauma. Then there is holography and fractalness, replication of same mechanisms, set of sets of instructions, and some critical content and functions in various locations in the brain. Then there is a principle of interchangeability. Higher functions can replace damaged lower functions. Seeing, for example, can replace damaged proprioception. And there are two types of processes. There are rational processes, which are discrete, atomistic, syllogistic, theory constructing and falsifying, or falsifiable. And there are rational processes, which are continuous, fractal, holographic, what do I mean when I say fractal and holographic? I mean that each part contains the total information about the whole, that each unit or part contain a connector to all others with sufficient information in such a connector. Sorry, uh, what I mean is that each unit or part contain a connector to all others. And the connector is, has sufficient information to reconstruct the other units if they are lost or unavailable. Only some brain processes are what we call conscious. Others, though equally complex, for example, the semantic interpretation of spoken texts, these may be unconscious. The same brain processes can be conscious at one time and unconscious at another. Consciousness, in other words, is a privileged tip of a submerged mental iceberg. One hypothesis is that an uncounted number of unconscious processes yield conscious processes, that it is an emergent phenomenon or epiphenomenon. Uh, this is a wave-particle duality. Unconscious brain processes are like a wave function, which collapses into the particle of consciousness. Another hypothesis, more closely aligned with tests and experiments, is that consciousness is like a searchlight. It focuses on a few privileged processes at a time, and thus makes them conscious. As the light of the of the consciousness searchlight moves on, new privileged processes, hitherto unconscious, become conscious, and the old ones recede into unconsciousness. We tend to ignore the fact that the mind is somehow entangled with the brain, and that the brain is hardware, an integral part of the body. It is the body that gives rise to the mind. Without the body, the mind would be so different that it could scarcely qualify as human. We are human because we have bodies. In the rarefied atmosphere of academe, this crucial observation is often neglected or willfully ignored, especially in Gedanken experiment, in thought experiments. It is impossible to rigorously prove or substantiate the existence of a soul or, or even a psyche. Numerous explanations have been hitherto offered over the millennia that what we humans call a soul is the way that we experience the workings of our brain, introspection, experience, 
This often leads to infinite regressions, of course. Another attempt is that the soul is an epiphenomenon, the software result of a hardware complexity, much the same way as temperature, volume, and pressure are the epiphenomenon of a large number of gas molecules. There's another school that says that the soul does exist and that it is distinct from the body in substance or lack of it, in form or lack of it, and in the set of laws that it obeys, spiritual rather than physical. The supporters of this dualistic camp say that correlation is not causation. And of course, the electrochemical activity in the brain, which corresponds to mental phenomena, does not mean that it is the mental phenomena. Mental phenomena do have brain hardware correlates, no doubt about this. But these correlates need not be confused with the mental phenomena themselves. Still, very few will dispute the strong connection between body and soul. Our psychic activity was attributed to the heart, then to the liver, even to the pineal gland. Nowadays it is attributed to the brain, apparently with somewhat better reasons. Since the body is a physical object, subject to physical laws, it follows that at least the connection between the two, body and soul, must obey the laws of physics. Another question is, what is the currency used by the two, by mind and body, in their communication? How do they communicate? Physical forces are mediated by subatomic particles. What serves to mediate between body and soul, or psyche, or mind? What is the packet? Language could be the medium and the mediating currency. It has both an internal psychic representation and an objective external one. It serves as a bridge between our inner emotions and cognitions and the outside physical world. It originates almost non-physically, kind of a mere thought, and has profound physical impacts and effects later on. It has quantum aspects combined with classical determinism. We propose that what we call the subconscious and the preconscious, the threshold of consciousness, are but fields of potentials, organized in lattices. But potentials of what? To represent realities, both external and internal, we use language. Language seems to be the only thing able to consistently link our internal world with our physical surroundings. Thus, the potentials ought to be lingual energy potentials. When one of the potentials is charged with lingual energy, in Freud's language, when cathexis happens, it becomes a structure. The atoms of this structure, the most basic units, are the clusters. The cluster constitutes a full crosscut of the mind, instinct, affect, beliefs, and cognitions. It is a schema, in effect. Um, it is holographic, it is fractalic, in that it reflects, through, though only in, uh, as a part, it reflects the whole. It is charged with the lingual energy which, which created it in the first place. The cluster is highly unstable, it's excited. Its uh, lingual energy must be therefore discharged, exactly as in, in particle physics. And this lingual energy can be released only in certain levels of energy, only in certain spheres or cycles of excitation, according to the exclusion principle in quantum mechanics. This is reminiscent of the rules governing the world of subatomic particles, as I've said. The release of the lingual energy is Freud's anti-cathexis. The lingual energy being what it is, it can be discharged only as language elements. Its excitation levels are lingual. Put differently, the cluster will lose energy to the environment, to the mind, in the shape of language, images, words, associations. The defense mechanisms known to us from classical psychology, projection, identification, projective identification, regression, denial, conversion reaction, displacement, rationalization, intellectualization, sublimation, repression, inhibition, anxiety, and a host of other defense mechanisms. They are all but sentences in the language, valid statements, strings, or theorems. Projection, for instance, is the sentence, it is not my trait, it is his trait. Some mechanisms, notable examples are rationalization and intellectualization, make conscious use of language or a type of formal logic. Whereas the levels of excitation, the language discharge, the lingual discharge, are discrete 
They're highly specific. The discharge energy is limited to certain um, specific language representations. These are the allowed representations. They are the only ones allowed or enabled uh, to borrow from computers in the allowed levels of excitation. This is the reason for the principles of disguise, camouflage, and substitution. An excitation is achieved only through specific visual or verbal representations. I remind you, these are the allowed representations. If two potentials occupy the same representational levels, they will become interchangeable. Thus, one lingual potential is able to assume the role of another lingual potential. This happens a lot in dreams. Each cluster can be described by its own function, by its eigenfunction, function. This explains the variance between humans and among the intrapsychic representations. When a cluster is realized, when its energy has been discharged in the form of an allowed lingual representation, it reverts to the state of a lingual potential. This is a constant bidirectional flow from potential to cluster and from cluster back to potential. The initial source of energy, as we said, is what we absorbed together with lingual representations from the outside. Lingual, lingual representations are energy, and they are thus assimilated by us. An exogenic event, uh, exogenous event, for this purpose is also a language element consisting of, consisting of a visual three-dimensional representation, audio component, and other sensor. So everything around us, everything in our environment, infuses us with energy, which is converted into allowed lingual representations. On the other hand, language potentials are charged with the energy. They become clusters, and they discharge the lingual energy through an allowed representation of the specific lingual energy that they possess, and they become potentials once more. When a potential materializes, that is, when it becomes a cluster after having been charged with lingual energy, so when it materializes, a potential singularity remains where once the material, material potential, materialized potential existed. The person experiences this singularity as an anxiety and does his utmost to convert the cluster back into the potential. This effort is the repression defense mechanism. So the energy used during repression is also a lingual type of energy. When the energy with which the cluster is charged is discharged at the allowed levels of representation, that is to say, through the allowed lingual representations, the cluster is turned back into a potential. This, in effect, is what we call repression. The anxiety signifies a state of schism in the field of potentials. It therefore deserves the name signal anxiety, and this is how it's used in professional literature. The signal anxiety designates not only a hole in the field of potentials, but also a conflict. How come? The material materialization of the potential, its transformation into a cluster, creates a change in the language field. Such a change can lead to a conflict with a social norm, for instance, or with a norm, personal value, or an inhibition, all being lingual representations. Such a conflict ostensibly violates the conditions of the field and leads to anxiety and repression. For, uh, Freud's trilateral model, id, ego, and superego, are now easily recognizable as various states of the language field. The id represents all the potentials in the field. It is the principle by which the potentials are charged with lingual energy. Id is, in other words, a field equation which dictates the potential in every point of the field. The ego is the interaction between the language field and the world. This interaction sometimes assumes the form of a conscious dialogue. And the superego is the interaction between the language field and the representations of the world in the language field. That is to say, the consequences of repression. All three are therefore activation modes. Each act of repression leaves traces. The field is altered by the act of repression. And this way preserves the information related to the act of repression. The sum of all repressions creates a representation of the world, both internal and external, in the field. And this is the superego, the functional pattern of the field of potentials, the subconscious or the regulatory system. The field 
plays a constant host to materializing potentials, the intrusion of content upon consciousness. Um, it plays a host to the excitation of allowed lingual levels, representational levels, allowed representations. And it plays a host to the realization of structures, their reversal to a state of being potentials. It is reality which determines which excitation and representation levels are the allowed ones and which ones are preserved. The complex of these processes is what we call consciousness. And all these functions together constitute the ego or the administrative or executive system. The ego is the functional mode of consciousness. The activities in reality are dictated both by the field of potentials and the, by the materializing structures. But the materialization of a structure is not a prerequisite for action. The id is a wave function, as we have said. It's the equation describing the state of the field. It details the location of the potentials that can, can materialize into structures. It also lists the anxiety-producing potential singularities into which a structure can be realized and then revert to being a potential. And so an association is the, con the reconstruction of all the allowed levels of excitation, the allowed representations of the lingual energy of a specific structure. Different structure will have common excitation levels at disparate times. Once structures are realized and thus become potentials, they go through the excitation level common to them and to other structures. This way they alter the field, they stamp the field in an identical manner. In other words, the field remembers similarly those structures which pass through a common excitation level in an identical manner. The next time that the potential materializes and becomes one of these structures, all the other structures are charged, all the other twin structures, similar structures, are charged with an identical lingual energy. They are all evoked and provoked together, elicited together, as a hypercluster, associative hypercluster. Another angle, when a structure is realized and reverts to being a potential, the field is stamped. When the same stamp is shared by a few structures, they form a potential hypercluster. From then on, whenever one of the potentials which is a member in the potential hypercluster materializes and becomes a structure, it drags with it all the other potentials which also become structures simultaneously. Potential hyperclusters hyper materialize into hyperclusters, or associative hyperclusters, whereas single potentials materialize only into clusters. The next phase of complexity is the network, a few hyperclusters together. This is what we call the memory operations. Memorizing is really the stamping of the field with the specific stamps of the various structures, actually with the specific stamps of their levels of excitation. Our memory uses lingual or linguistic representations. When we read, when we see something, we absorb it into the field of potentials, the language field. The absorbed energy fosters out of the field of potentials a structure or a hypercluster. And this is the process of imprinting. The resultant structure is realized in our brain through the allowed levels of excitation using the allowed lingual representations. It is repressed, it stamps the field, it creates a memory, and rejoins the field as a potential. The levels of excitations are like strings that tie the potentials to each other. All the potentials that um, participate in a given level of excitations, or a given level of representation uh, of the language, all of them become a hypercluster during the phase of materialization. And this also is the field's organizational principles. principle. The potentials are aligned along the field lines, the levels of excitation specific to these potentials. The connection between them is through lingual energy, but it is devoid of any specific form of logic, mechanical or algorithmic. Thus, for example, if potential P1 and potential P2 pass through the same excitation level on their way to becoming structures, they will organize themselves along the same line in the field. They will become a hypercluster or a network. Uh, when they materialize. They can, however, relate to each other a-logically by negation or contradiction and still constitute a part of the same hypercluster. 
This capacity is reminiscent of superposition in quantum mechanics. Memory is the stamping of the excitation levels upon the language field. It is complex and contains lingual representations, which are the only correct representations, the only correct solutions, or the only allowed levels of excitations of certain structures. It can be, therefore, said that the process of stamping the field, the process of memory, represents a registration or a catalogue of the allowed levels of excitation. The field equations are non-temporal, atemporal, and non-local. The field has no time or space characteristics. The id, for example, the field uh, state function or the wave function, has solutions which do not entail the use of spatial or temporal language elements. The asymmetry of the time arrow in our mind is derived from the superego, which preserves the representations of the outside world. The superego records an um, informational asymmetry of the field itself. We call it memory, thermodynamic memory. We possess access to past information, and we have no access to information pertaining to the future. The superego is strongly related to data processing, representations of reality, and as a result, to informational and thermodynamic time asymmetries, or entropy. The feeling of the present, on the other hand, is yielded by the ego. It surveys the activities in the field, which by definition take place concurrently. The ego feels simultaneous, concurrent, current. We could envisage a situation of partial repression of a structure, certain elements in the structure, let's say only the ideas, or only the beliefs, will degrade into potentials while others, for example, affect, will remain in the form of a structure. This situation could lead to pathologies, and often does. And this is the time, I think, to discuss pathologies and symptoms. A schism is formed in the transition from potential to structure in the materialization process. It is a hole in the field of language, which provokes anxiety. The realization of a structure brings about a structural change in the field and conflicts with other representations, other parts of the field. This conflict in itself is anxiety-provoking, and this combined anxiety forces the individual to use lingual energy to achieve repression. A pathology occurs when only partial repression is achieved, accomplished, and a part structure, part potential hybrid results. This happens when the wrong levels of excitation were selected because of previous deformations in the language field. In classical psychology, the terms complexes or primary repression are used. The selection of wrong forbidden excitation levels has two effects. First of all, this partial repression and the materialization of other potentials into structures linked by the same wrong levels of excitation. Put differently, a pathological hypercluster is formed. The members of such, in such a cluster are all the structures that are aligned along a field line. Field line, which is the erroneously selected level of excitation. And so, the members of this cluster are these structures, plus the partial structure whose realization was blocked because of this wrong selection. This makes it difficult for the hypercluster to be realized, and a repetition a compulsion or an obsessive compulsive disorder ensues. These obsessive compulsive behaviors are an effort to use lingual representations to con consummate the realization of the pathological stuck hypercluster. A structure can occupy only one level of excitation at any given time. This is why our attention span is limited and why we have to concentrate on one event or subject at a time and why we can remember only a limited number of items. But there is no limit on the number of simultaneously materialized and realized clusters. Sometimes there are events possessed of such tremendous amounts of energy that no corresponding levels of excitation, no corresponding levels of language can be found for these events. This energy remains trapped in the field of potentials and detaches, we call it dissociation, uh, detaches the part of the field in which it is trapped from the field itself. This is a variety of stamping, the memory of the event, which is wide uh, spectrum. It incorporates strong affective elements. It is direct. It is irreversible. Only an outside lingual energetic manipulation, such as psychotherapy, can bridge such an abyss. The earlier this traumatic, cataclysmic, apocalyptic event 
the more entrenched the dissociation is a trait of an ever-changing field. In cases of dissociative identity disorder, formerly known as multiple personality disorder, the dissociation can become a field of its own, or a pole of the field. Stamping of the field is achieved also by, by a persistent repetition of an external event. A relevant hypercluster is materialized, is realized through predetermined levels of excitation, and reverts to being a collection of potentials, thus enhancing previous identical standards. Ultimately, no mediation of a structure would be needed between the field and the outside event. Automatic activities, such as driving, are prime examples of this mechanism. Hypnosis similarly involves numerous repetitions of external events, yet here the whole field of potentials, the whole field of language, is dissociated. The reason is that all levels of excitations are occupied by the hypnotist. To achieve this, he uses a full concentration of attention and a calculated choice of vocabulary and intonation and possibly props. Structures cannot be realized during hypnosis, and the energy of the event, in this case unadulterated lingual energy, remains confined and creates dissociations which are evoked by the hypnotist, correspond and respond to his instructions. A structure cannot be materialized when its level of excitation is, is occupied. This is why no conscious memory of the hypnotic session is available. Such a memory, however, is available in the field of potentials. This is direct stamping, achieved without going through the structure and without the materialization process. In a way, the hypnotist is a kind of externalized ultimate hypercluster. His lingual energy is absorbed in the field of potentials, which remains trapped, generating dissociations and stamping the field of potentials without resorting to mediation of structure, without resorting to consciousness. The role of stamping, memorizing, is relegated to the hypnotist, and the whole process of realization is imputed to him and to the language that he uses. It's kind of an outsourcing of cerebral functions, or field functions. A distinction between endogenous and exogenous events is very essential here. Both types of events operate on the field of potentials. Both of them bring about the materialization of structures or dissociations. Examples, dreams and hallucinations are endogenous events, but they lead to dissociations. What about automatism? For example, automatic writing. And what about distributed attention? Automatic writing is an endogenous event. It is induced exclusively, exclusively under, under hypnosis or in a trance. The lingual energy of the hypnotist remains trapped in the field of potentials and causes automatic writing. Because it never materializes into a structure, it never reaches consciousness. Non-language representations which pass through a loud level of excitation, levels of excitation, are generated in this case. Conversely, all other exogenous events run their normal course, even when their results conflicted with the results of the endogenous event. For example, the subject can write something, which is a result of the trapped, aforementioned trapped energy and provide verbally, when asked, an answer which starkly contradicts what he had just written. The question asked is an exogen exogenous event. It influences the field of potentials. It affects the materialization uh, of a structure, which is realized through allowed levels of excitation. These levels of excitation constitute the answer provided by the subject. And this constitutes a vert vertical dissociation between the written and the verbal messages between the exogenous event and the endogenous event. So in automatic writing, there are two processes going on, and they can contradict each other. At the same time, it is a horizontal dissociation between the motor function and the regulatory or critical function. The written word, which contradicts the verbal answer, turns by its very writing into an exogenous event, and then a conflict erupts. The trapped energy is probably organized in a coherent struct uh, structural manner. Uh, this could be Hilgard's hidden observer. When two exogenous events influence the field of potential simultaneously, a structure materializes. But two structures cannot be realized through the same allowed level of excitation. And this creates a conflict. How is the status allowed or disallowed of a level of excitation determined? 
Well, a level of excitation is allowed under the following two cumulative conditions. One, when the energy that it represents corresponds to the energy of the structure, in a way when they speak the same uh, language. But there's a second condition, when it is not occupied by another structure at the exact infinitesimal moment, uh, infinitesimal moment of realization. The consequence, only one of the two exogenous events which share the same level of excitation, the same ling lingual representation, only one of these two materializes into a structure. The second non-materialized event remains trapped in the field of potentials. Thus, only one of them reaches consciousness and awareness, the other does not. So we are talking essentially about some kind of homeostasis or equilibrium of this field of potential, potentials. The field aspires to a state of energetic equilibrium and in a way um, uh, attempts to satisfy the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. It also aspires to homeostasis, a functionality which is independent of environmental conditions. When these are violated, the equilibrium or, or homeostasis, energy has to be traded, normally exported, to restore them. This is achieved by the materialization of structures in such levels of excitation as to compensate for deficiencies, offset surpluses, and in general, balance the internal energy of the field. The materializing structures are chosen under the constraint that their levels of excitation brings the field to a state of equilibrium, restores the homeostasis. They use lingual energy and the allowed level of levels of excitation, of course. And this admittedly is a rigid and restraining choice. In other words, this is a defense mechanism. The, um, and there's another possibility, though. Alternatively, energy is imported by the stamping of the field of potentials via exog uh, by exogenous events. Only the events whose energy balances the internal energy of the field are selected. Events whose energy does not comply with this restraint are rejected or distorted. And this selectivity also characterizes defense mechanisms. Patterns are an attribute of networks, which are composed of interconnected and interacting hyperclusters. In this case, the hyperclusters are the nodes of the network. The field of potentials is stamped by all manner of events, endogenous events, exogenous events. The events are immediately classified in accordance with their energy content. They become part of hyperclusters or networks through the process of realization in which lingual energy decays through the allowed levels of excitation. These are processes known as assimilation in a network or accommodation, the response of the network to assimilation, its alteration as a result. Every event belongs in a hypercluster or in a network. If its level of excitation is not recognized uh, from the past, the brain first checks the most active hyperclusters and networks, those of the recent past, the immediate present. And finally, the brain examines these hyperclusters, those hyperclusters and networks, which are rarely used, primitive ones. Upon detecting an energetically appropriate hypercluster or network, the event is incorporated into them. This again is a simulation. Later on, the hypercluster or the network adapt to the event, and this is what we call accommodation, and it leads to equilibrium. A simulation is possible which is not followed by accommodation. This leads to regression and to the extensive use of primitive defense mechanisms. Various scholars have touched upon many of the elements in this presentation. Start with Fisk in 1980. A person tends to remain, uh, to maintain, I'm sorry, some correspondence between his fixed level of energy and his level of energy at any given moment. External events change the field equation change the fixed level of energy. And they activate calibration and regulation mechanisms that reduce or increase the level of activity. This restores the individual to his normal plateau of activity and to a balance of energy. These energetic changes are considered in advance and the level of activity is updated even before the gap is formed. When stimuli occur, uh, recur, they lose some of their effectiveness and they require less energy in relating to them. Dynamics, such as excitement, Differentiation and development provoke such an excited state, and it can disintegrate the field. A downward calibration mechanism is activated, the integration process. 
When an event cannot be attributed to a hypercluster, to a network, or to a string, a field line, a new structure is invented to incorporate it. As a result, the very shape of the field is altered. If the required alteration is sizable, it calls for the dismantling of hyperstructures on various levels and for a forced experimentation with the construction of alternative hyperstructures. The parsimonious path of least resistance calls for an investment of minimum energy to contain maximum energy. Coherence, cohesiveness. Structures of whose levels of level of energy, level of excitation, is less than the new structure are detached from the new hyperstructure created in order to accommodate it or to incorporate into other hyperstructures. So let's repeat this. Structures whose level of energy or excitation is less than the new structure are detached from the new hyperstructures created in order to accommodate it. And this is what we call denial. Sometimes they are incorporated, to, in, incorporated into other hyperstructure, kind of forced matching. A hyperstructure with, which contains at least one structure attached to it in a process of force matching is a forced hyperstructure. The new hyperstructure is energetically st stable, while the forced hyperstructure is energetically unstable. This is why the forced hyperstructure pops into consciousness. It is excited. It pops more often than other hyperstructures, including new ones. This is the essence of a defense mechanism an automatic pattern of thinking or acting which is characterized by its rigidity, repetitiveness, compulsiveness, and behavioral and mental contraction effects. A constant instability is experienced as tension and anxiety. A lack of internal consistency and limited connections are the results. Meyer's work in 1982 distinguishes between three components, emotions, which are potentials in my work, cognitions, which are structures in my work, and interpretations, which are the hyperstructures in my work, and of course memory, the stamping process. In 1980, Minsky uh, suggested that memory is a complete conscious state, and it is reconstructed as such. In my terminology, the structure is hologramic and fractal-like. Lazarus suggested that cognition, the structure, leads to emotions, decays into a potential. And this is a partial description of the second leg of the process. Uh, Zoyonk, in 1980, suggested that emotions, potentials, precede cognitions, structures. Emotion is based on an element of energy, and cognition is based on an element of information. This distinction seems to me to be a bit superfluous. superfluous. Information is also energy, packed and ordered in a manner which enables the appropriately trained human brain to identify it as such. Information, therefore, is the name that we give to a partial mode of delivery of energy. Eisen, in 1987, discussed emotions and said that they influence the organization of cognitions and allow for further intercognitive flexibility by encouraging their interconnectedness. My interpretation is different. Emotions, potentials, which organize themselves in structures, are cognitions. The apparent distinction between emotions and cognitions is deceiving and misleading. This also renders meaningless the question of which precedes what. See also Piaget, Hayes in 1977, Marcus, Murius, Leventhal in 1979. They all said essentially the same. Greenberg and Safran said that emotions are automatic responses to events. The primordial emotion is a, bio is biologic, is a biological, that is to say physical, mechanism. It reacts to events. It endows them with meaning and sense. It therefore assists in the processing of information. The processing is speedy. It is based on a response, uh, on responses to a limited set of attributes. The emotional reaction is the raw material for the formation of cognitions. As opposed to Leventhal, I distinguish the processing of data within the field of potentials, the processing of potentials, from the processing of data through structures, the structural processing. Laws of transformation and conservation of energy Prevail. Um, excuse me, I, I lost my place. Hold on for a second and I will find it again, hopefully. Just a second. Again, my apologies. So, um, laws of transformation and observation of energy prevail within the two types of processing. Energy is of the informational or lingual type.
The processing of potentials is poor and stereotypical, and its influence is mainly motoric. Structural processing, on the other hand, is rich, and spawns additional structures and, and alterations to the field itself. Horowitz in 1988 said that all states of consciousness act in concert. When transition between these states occurs, all the components change simultaneously. Of course, in Gestalt theory, the organism tends to organize the stimuli in its awareness in the best possible manner, the euphormic or eumorphic principle. The characteristics of the organization are simplicity, regularity, coordination, continuity, proximity between components, and clarity. In short, it adopts the optimal path of least resistance, or path of minimum energy. Epstein, in 1983, said that the processes of integration, assimilation, and differentiation accommodation foster harmony. This harmony is generated by repeating a fixed pattern without any corresponding accommodative or assimilative change. Filter is a situation where a structure in the past of least resistance or the past of minimum energy materializes every time as the default structure. It therefore permanently occupies certain levels of excitation, preventing other structures from materializing through these levels of excitation. This also weakens the stamping process. The Bauer model of memory organization, suggested in 1981, says that our memory is made of units, representations which are the stampings of structures on the field. When one unit is activated, it activates other units linked to it by way of association. There are also inhibitory mechanisms which apply to some of these links. The memory unit activates certain units while simultaneously inhibiting, inhibiting other units. The stamped portion of the field of potentials which materializes into a structure does so within a hyperstructure and along a string which connects similar or identical um, stamped areas. I call it a field line. All the stamped areas which are connected to a hyperstructure materialize simultaneously. They occupy loud levels of excitation. This way, other structures are prevented from using the same levels of excitation. Activation and inhibition or prevention are simultaneous. The model of internal compati compatibility says that a coherent experience is an affective dimension, potential, a dimension of meaning, which I call structure, and a dimension of memory, which I call stamping. Awareness is created when there is compatibility between these dimensions, when the structures materialize and dematerialize, are realized without undergoing cha changes. The subconscious is a state of incompatibility. This forces the structures to change. It provokes denial or forced adjustment until compatibility is obtained. Emotions relate to appropriate meanings and memories. In my language, potentials become structures which are, as we said, hologramic and of fractal nature. There are also inter-experiential knots. Emotions, meanings, and all memories interlink. A constant dynamic is at play. Repressions, denials, and forced adjustments break structures apart and detach them from each other. This reduces the inner complexity and internal poverty results. According to Epstein in 1983, pathology occurs when mental content, when events, is rejected from consciousness. In my language, a potential which does not materialize. Mental content which cannot be assimilated because it does not fit in also creates pathology. There is no structure appropriate to it, and this entails rewiring and formation of unstable interim structures in the field. The latter, these interim structures are highly excitable, and they tend to get materialized and realized in constant default levels of excitation. This, in turn, blocks these levels of excitation to other structures, and these are what we call psychological defense mechanisms. And Ipsen says that preverbal and averbal processing also can create pathologies, and in my language, no structure materializes. In uh, my work, both the first and the third processes are assumed to be facets of the same thing, actually. Kilstrom in 1984 said that a trauma tears apart the emotional side of the experience from its verbal cognitive side. The potential never materializes. It does not turn into a structure. In 1981, Bauer said, Bauer said that learning and memory are situational, context-dependent. The more the learning is conducted in surroundings which remind the student of the original situation, the more effective it proves to be. A context is an exogenous event. 
whose energy evokes hyperstructures, networks, along a stream or a feeling line. The more the energy of a situation resembles or is identical to the energy of the original situation, the more effectively will the right stream resonate. This would lead to an optimal situational resonance. Eisen said that it is the similarity of meanings which encourages memorizing. In my terminology, structures belong to the same hyperstructures or networks, along a common string in the field of potentials, common field line. Bartlett in 1932 and Nasser in 1967 both suggested that memory does not reflect reality. It is the reconstruction of reality in light of attitude, attitudes towards reality, and it changes according to circumstances. The stamping is reconstructed and is transformed into a structure whose energies are influenced by its environment. Again, Kilstrom in 1984 said that data processing is a process in which stimuli from the outer world are absorbed, go through an interpretative system, are classified, stored, and reconstructed in memory. The subconscious is a part of the conscious world, and it participates in its design through the processing of the incoming stimuli and their analysis. These processing and analysis are mostly unconscious, but they exert influence over the conscious, over consciousness. Data is stored in three loci. The first one is in the sensuous storage center. This is a subconscious registry, and it keeps in touch with the higher cognitive processes, the imprinting of events in the field of potentials. This is where events are analyzed to their components and patterns and acquire meaning. Then there's the primary short-term memory, which is characterized by the focusing of attention, conscious processing, materialization of a structure, and repetition of material stored. And then there's long-term storage, readily available to consciousness. We distinguish three types of memory. Not reconstructable, no stamping was made. Reconstructable from one of the storage areas, is within a structure, post-stamping. And memory on the level of central perception, a reception and processing. The latter is left as a potential, does not materialize into a structure, and the imprinting is also the stepping. The data processing is conscious and partly subconscious. And this structure is realized, a part of it remains a potential. Material which was processed in the subconscious cannot be consciously reconstructed in its subconscious form. A potential, after all, is not the structure. The stimuli, having passed through central data processing and having been transformed into processed material, constitute a series of assumptions concerning the essence of the received stimulus. Imprinting the field of potentials creates structures using lingual energy. Mike and Baum and Gilmore in 1984 divided the cognitive activity to three components, events, processes, and cognitive structures. An event means activity, some kind of activity. And in my language, it's a materialization of potentials into structures. A process is the principle according to which data are organized, stored, and reconstructed, or the laws of energetic transition from potential to structure. A cognitive structure is a structural pattern which receives data and alters both the data and itself, thus influencing the entire field. External data are absorbed by internal processes. For a minute, I again lost my place. I am not very friendly with uh, Microsoft Word. My frustrate apologies. I'll be back in a minute. So, external data are absorbed by internal structures, imprinting, and are influenced by cognitive processes. They become cognitive events, the excitation of a structure, the materialization into a structure. In all these, there is a subconscious part. Subconscious processes design, receive data, and change them according to predetermined principles. The data storage mechanisms, the reconstruction of memory, co conclusiveness, searching and review of information, and other principles. Three principles shape the interpretation of, of information. The principle of availability is the first one. The individual relates to available information and not necessarily to relevant data, the defaulting of structures. The principle of representation relating to information only if it matches conscious data. This principle is another rendition of the path of least resistance, or minimum energy. It does take less energy, and it does provoke less resistance, to relate only to conforming data. 
The last principle is the principle of affirmation. The search for an affirmation of a theory or a hypothesis concerning reality, bringing about in its way the affirmation of the theory's predictions. 1984 Bowers distinguished between two kinds of knowledge and two types of deficiency. Distinction, lack of distinction, understanding, lack of understanding. Perception is a processing of information and consciousness is being aware of perception. The focusing of attention transforms perception, imprinting and the evocation of structure, into a conscious experience, the materialization of the structure. Perception antecedes awareness. The subconscious can be divided to four departments. Subthreshold perception, memory forgetfulness, repression and dissociation. There is no full segregation between these compartments. There are cross-influences, of course. This is a dynamic structure, in flux. The distinction between repression and dissociation? In repression, there is no notice of anxiety-producing content. In dissociation, the internal ties between mental or behavioral systems uh, um, are not noted, and there is no obscuring or erasure of content. Intuition is intellectual sensitivity to information coming from the external or from the internal surroundings, though this information was not yet clearly registered. It channels the study of the world and the observations which must lead to deep insights. This, in effect, is awareness of the process of materialization of the structure. Attention is focused on the materialization rather, on the, uh, rather than on the structure being materialized. So here I suggested a field theory of the mind, and I compare it, compared it to various previous work. I hope you find the insights illuminating or at least thought provoking. Of course, it's a work in progress. It has to do a lot with me quantum mechanics and field theories and physics because um, um, originally I'm a physicist. My original training is as a physicist. And um, I believe that if we think of consciousness as a field, we tend to gain additional interesting insights. Thank you very much for listening and have a great conference.